Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to be giving a presentation today on crypto economics and science, um, but I do want it to be really collaborative and interactive and really open source the content, so I'm not going to give you all of the content, and I would like people like um, our CAD-CAD crew and Paul and anyone else in the audience as well that has been maybe speaking today or involved in another blockchain or science project to help out with the content. Um, so what we're really going to cover is kind of what is crypto economics, what is token engineering, and a little bit about curation markets, TCRs, TCPs, NFTs, stable coins. Um, who of you know what, uh, just to give me a quick idea, who know what token curated registries are? Who of you have no idea what a token curated registry is? Okay, some of you just don't like raising your hands. <laughs> um, token bonding curves? I put the C and the B the wrong way around. <laughs> okay, cool. Who of you are building projects using token bonding curves? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I know that there are some projects that are currently sitting here that are using them, um, so I'm going to get you guys to give some input in on it. And the, those of you that don't know what it is, I would like you to ask all of the questions. Um, other than that, yeah. All right, so uh, to give a quick intro to myself, my name is Devin. I'm originally from South Africa, Johannesburg, but I've been in Cape Town for about seven years after that and been living in Switzerland for the past year now. Um, I studied a BCom and IS at UCT, so a little bit of computers, a little bit of business, a little bit of everything in between. And then after that, or well, my previous life prior to blockchain, um, I was actually a Google Trekker, uh, a project manager for Google Trekker South Africa, so I spent about a year hiking around the country collecting 360-degree street view imagery of all of the hiking trails, so that was quite cool. Um, prior to that, I worked at Bank, so I mean, it's, it's not, not as great. Um, <laughs> a bank, yeah. Uh, so I did my Simpson corporates, um, and then Gratefully, after that, I founded a blockchain software development studio with Paul, um, and out of that spun Molecule. So it's been quite a wild, I think, change in careers, a hectic few years, but it's been really exciting. Um, in addition to that, I also run a monthly curation markets call, so it's an online global call. The next one's actually this Wednesday, if you guys want to join. We got Billy Rennekamp from the Clovers Network and Mike Elias from Ideas Cartel, who's going to be presenting. Anyone's welcome to join, anyone's welcome to apply to present, and it's a really cool collection of people sharing ideas, sharing knowledge, and it's a great way to build up your knowledge base. Thanks, Simka. <laughs> um, I also run blockchain community calls. Uh, so that's a monthly one. It's for more introductory level people. So any projects can also apply to present on them. It's a, it's a more entry level um, audience of understanding. So we basically cover sometimes like blockchain 101. Um, but it's really, it's really interactive as well. It's a great starting place. Really friendly and supportive community. Um, I recently started up the Blockchain and Pharma Network in Basel and Switzerland, so I don't know if you guys have got it by now, but a lot of my work actually uh, revolves around community building, ecosystem design, working with people, creating communities of people that want to share, collaborate, and be together, and are interested in the same thing, because that's a really important part of building out a technology, um, which I'll, I'll actually show you a little bit about that later as well. Um, I run, I'm a part of the Future Females, which is an international girl, girl blah, 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 empowerment, female empowerment, uh, female Entrepreneurs Network. Uh, there's about 80,000 people globally in this network. So I started up the one in Berlin in 2017, I think, and now I've started up the one in Switzerland. But there are in about 20 other countries as well. Uh, I also run Ethereum meetups across Africa. Actually, not anymore. I've recently just backed down from that. I ran them in 15 African countries um, and with a global, global community base of about 15,000 people. So the, the community was insane, the hunger to learn in Africa was powerful, it was very inspiring. I'm sure if you guys are interested in any of that, I'll talk to you about it later. And then last year, or oh, this year actually, wow, um, I ran ETH Cape Town, which is the Ethereum hackathon. Um, first time it was on the African continent, it was amazing. We had, I think, close to 200 hackers, 33 submissions, 66% of them were South Africans, so there was a lot of involvement from the, from the community, but that's kind of what I've been involved in. So now what I'd really like to do um, today is get the involvement of this community here, talking to one another, figuring out a little bit more about one another, and seeing where we can grow our strengths here. Um, 
Yeah, um, so a little bit of an introduction to Molecule. I was gonna go into this a little bit more, but Paul's already given a really good presentation on it. So um, for those of you that didn't hear, Molecule is an open source ecosystem to incentivize decentralized research and development in chemical compounds and drugs. If you have any questions on this, I'm gonna let you go straight to Paul. Um, but if he didn't mention, which I'm sure he did, we're actually launching our alpha soon, which is the Molecule Catalyst. It is crowdfunding scientific research. Um, using token funding curves. Yeah. <laughs> and we're actually launching with a really cool project as well. So it's the huge sort of microdosing um, psilocybin for creativity and mood enhancements. Um, so it's a really exciting study that we're launching with. Um, it's with Rotem Petranka and Thomas Anderson from the University of Toronto um, Psychedelic, it's, it's, it's a long acronym, hold on. <laughs> uh, come and ask me afterwards. But yeah, so, Crypto requires an understanding not just of the tech, not just of how to develop, not just how to code, but it's actually a number of things. It's the economics, it's the business, it's the cryptography, finance, cybersecurity, monetary policy, security law, psychology, sociology, geopolitics, and history. It's never just, it's never just one thing. There are so many things that influence our decisions and how we act and what we do. Um, and this is the tweet was actually, it's quite a while ago, it was in 5th of March, 2018. So I mean, it still stands true. And I think if anything, it's even more now. Um, that you have to consider when you're building systems like this because they are complex systems. Um, so crypto economics, not to blow your brains, but it is cryptography and economics. Um, so it is the study of economic interaction in adversarial environments. Um, designing systems like this, decentralized systems, peer-to-peer -peer networks, we have to, we are often faced with the challenge of um, there's going to be bad actors in the system and we kind of need to account for that. Um, so using <laughs> cryptography and economics, economics on steroids. Um, we get to use the power of economics, but we get to secure it with cryptography. Um, and a lot of blockchain technology runs on the principles of these crypto economics, some of which we're gonna to touch on now. Um, and we're going to look at new ways to incentivize changes in our behavior. Uh, I think one of the most important things to consider with these systems, with crypto economics, with blockchain, with trying to in, um, incentivize behavior changes is that a lot of this is still, it's, it's experiments. This is not the way to do it, it's not the blueprint, we're not gonna say this is how you do it and this is gonna be the result. Um, it's gonna be very varied and we have to factor in that change and how much we don't know. So crypto economics, why do we need it? I mentioned this earlier, in decentralized peer-to-peer -peer systems with no centralized authority, we must assume that there will be bad actors looking to disrupt the system. So we use crypto economics to create a robust decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network that thrive over time despite adversaries attempting to disrupt them. Um, in summary, cryptography, economics, uh, we secure the networks and we incentivize the actors. But also keeping in mind that um, there are a number of different things that go into this. And what we'll cover today is token engineering, just the definition of it. We're not gonna dive into too much token engineering, but we're going to dive into curation markers, token curated registries, token bonding curves, and then a little bit about economic modeling simulations with um, CatCat. And the way that we're gonna do this is through a fishbowl type style. Yeah. Yay, so that means you guys actually have to speak back to me now. Um, yeah. Do we have a microphone that floats around and would it be possible to turn the chairs to face each other? It can be a little bit dynamic. Yeah? It doesn't matter. I mean, we have a microphone now. Okay, who of you work in blockchain yeah. projects? Yeah, and we can like just give it a while. Please raise your hands and interact with me. Yeah. <laughs> who of you work in science? Hi. All right, okay, cool. More. Okay, cool. Yeah. What is both? Yeah. Who work in both? Three, four, four, five? <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so the way that this fishbowl panel works basically is I'll bring up a topic and I'll give you maybe a little bit of an introduction around and I'm gonna pick two people. I'm gonna pick these two at the front because they're here already. Um, and they are gonna be my, my core panelists, but then the, the other two seats basically, they're gonna revolve. So if you guys have a question to ask, um, you're part of the panel then as well, and somebody out there has to answer the question. So generally we have the panel up here. Do you want, should I put the panel up here? Yeah. Can you just bring four yeah. chairs to yeah, us yeah, up yeah. here? Yeah, Cool. Yeah, cool. I don't think he realizes I'm talking to him. We need some beer, then it would be easier, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for bearing with me and rearranging all the furniture. Yeah. Um, Cool, so can we do, uh, you guys probably, five, been, no, just four. Four is fine. Yeah, okay. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up a topic and then I want at least one volunteer to come up and take a seat and answer 
answer the question, or if you want to ask a question as well, you have to take a seat and sit up on stage while you get it answered. Um, cool, so our first topic is Token Engineering 101, and what I have here is Systems and Mechanism Design plus Software Engineering, Token Engineering. It's rigorous design, analysis, and verification of systems assisted by tools that reconcile theory with practice. Here. Engineering is a discipline of responsibility, being ethically and professionally accountable to creations, and number four, consists of ethical choices. Crypto economics are considered a building block of token engineering. But token engineering is not necessarily token economics. It is a building block. So I, um, I would like to ask an open question to you guys. Um, who doesn't understand what token engineering is? What is a token? <laughs> what is a token? Okay, the, what is ethical is more or less clear, but we should be starting by asking what is a token. Does anyone want to answer the question as well? You're welcome to come up. Okay, I, I can give my interpretation. I think in the context that we have a token, I mean, a token is just an entry in a database, basically. Uh -huh. It's an entry in a smart contract um, that allocates that token to a specific person. It's actually really, really simple but from a database perspective, but I think the most common conception that we all have is that a token confers some type of right. Um, yeah. I, I was gonna say, so I, I generally, in the context of blockchain and uh, crypto systems, um, associate token with an atomic unit of information that is sort of provable through some sort of on-chain process or through some cryptographic process. So it may not necessarily be something that you can transfer, but it's something that you can verify to be true, and it may generally confer a right or at the very least prove the existence of something. So it's a basically, I, I think the easiest way to describe it would be an atomic unit of information, which is cryptographically verifiable. <laughs> Please have John. There is definitely is not a like single definition. So, um. okay. So uh, I think uh, that the token is um, um, the, the the most defining part of it is that is uh, it is a kind of digital information that is uh, owned in a non non custodial way. So uh, and it, actually it is transferable. Um, so this is for me the definition of, of a token. Um, that uh, was not possible before these uh, inventions of uh, decentralized blockchains to own a digital um, a token. Like uh, you have your euro on the bank, but it's custodial. The bank or whoever runs the database is in control. So it's ownership, but not possession. And tokens can be possessed in the way that they are non-custodial. And this is, in my view, is the most important part of it. <laughs> So the one thing I will note is that that is a sort of subset so of the definition where it's sort of verifiable state information like we were discussing. So if you take a broad definition, you can get something that encapsulates things that are not inherently transferable, but that the, that definition is in fact created in order to include, but not exclusively include, the definition that you're giving. Which again, isn't to say that it's the ultimate definition, but there is sort of narrower and broader definitions so that you're, are So you're used. talking about, for example, a verifiable claim or something like this, which yes. is a token. Okay, okay. I think this, if it's a, um, it's a more broader set. Um, so I think what you're referring to is absolutely correct. I think it's a feature of a token, like this self-sovereignty that like we can, we can own it and it can be transferred on um, a network without a custodian. I think in the future we'll see many, many sort of um, token-based systems that still have custodians. Because for example, if, if I now tokenize my house or like a piece of real estate and the tokens are self-sovereign and I lose them, and this is a question that often comes up. Once you start to tokenizing assets and then you lose those assets, like is it like too bad you just lost your house or like a part of it? Because um, <laughs> you lost it. I mean, it's, that's one of the huge problems with crypto in general is that like the custodianship of private keys and yeah, but I think that takes us down a completely different rabbit hole. 
So token engineering. <laughs> so, so actually, this is a good segue it to token, good token engineering, though, because part of the reason that I gave the definition I gave about system state and atomic units of information is that when you are engineering systems, there may very well be aspects of those systems that don't meet the definition of a sort of transferable asset or a, a specific you know, instance of a transferable right, but actually just more generally represent state information of a system which is mutated by some transactions or some activity by the users, and that the token engineering sort of subdiscipline is a bit more interested in the sort of system design with the crypto economic primitives as tools. I agree. <laughs> no, I just, I just want to add that I think a lot of what we think token engineering has become as a discipline is much more like system design, and then the token takes a defining point in that system. And I think, I mean, the whole point of token engineering, I think, emerged. Um, so specifically, is the guy from Ocean still here? No. Oh, no, no. But a massive shout out to Ocean, and specifically to Ocean in Berlin. Uh, I think, in my view, I think they really kick-started a massive conversation around token engineering, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, which, uh, it has brought this space a huge step forward. And I think really token engineering emerged out of, partially out of the ICO boom, which um, like the earliest definition I think that Trent gave around token engineering was like it was ethical design. Like if you build, like if you're an engineer and you build a bridge, you wanna make sure that that bridge is sound and stable so it doesn't collapse. And I think a lot of the early token economies that were launched through ICOs, there wasn't even, it was like a design for a bridge, but like not, completely unimplementable. That would just coax people into like funding the bridge, but the bridge never even got built. And so I think token engineering emerged out of that, really trying to build sound bridges. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, so to kind of go along this, this vein, one, thank you for making the sort of ethical considerations and the, the engineering ethics, which is actually, you know, long, has a long history in its own right, uh, forefront in your definition. But going back to sort of talking to Trent and the original coinage of the term token engineering, one of the things that was interesting in a very early conversation I had with him about this was the choice of the term token engineering and its relation to electrical engineering, where in electrical engineering, there's sort of these units of information in the form of electricity and electrons flowing through systems. And you use them to design circuits, you use them to design control systems, you use them to make stuff. But actually, the unit of information is in the flow of electrons through those systems. And then there was this sort of mini debate about what to call it, and it kind of you know, was defended as token engineering on the grounds that the tokens themselves are actually those atomic units of information, which is why it has a sort of analogy to other engineering fields where um, the sort of thing that's being named is the thing that carries the information in the system. Thank you. Didn't, didn't you just explain cat cat through the back door somehow to us? It's like because doesn't it like so my understanding of the system is that it basically simulates uh, business or like economies by like having single units flying through the system. Like I, in, I think no. that's later in your agenda. Oh, okay, sorry, so sorry, sorry, I, I think okay. I'm gonna yeah, try to keep on sense. track. Yeah, but yeah, we yeah, will yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, modeling. Yeah, sorry, yeah sorry, we're yeah, definitely right. gonna touch on yeah. economic modeling okay, and simulations yeah, 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 sorry, a little sorry, bit later. Sorry. Um, but just to round up the, the token engineering talk is there is a big movement as well starting up specifically this year. I've noticed they had their first token engineering hackathon, I think a few weeks back, which is really exciting to see. There's token engineering global. Um, and you know, we're really starting to see more of an uprise and people actually putting um, conscious thought into how they're designing their systems now, as opposed to maybe the ICO craze. Um, so the next, topic that we're going to talk on is curation markets. Um, and I have here uh, curation markets reduce information and symmetry in the market through the usage of novel skin in the game signals generated through the use of tokenized crypto economic incentive games. Does everyone agree with this statement? And if not, do you want to come up? Or if you do even, do you want to elaborate on why I've used this particular quote? or anyone on stage right So I think maybe if we go more into like the, I think the most common forms of curation markets today in, in the engineering space are um, token curated registries and token mining curves. 
Yeah, so the ones that I have got here already are, are those those two exactly. And then I said also just because we needed to cover it quick to maybe understand those are fungible tokens um, and non-fungible tokens. So NFTs like CryptoKitties. Um, does everyone understand the distinction? If you put, if you don't, just raise your hand. <laughs> Sorry if you guys are in the light there. Who doesn't know what an NFT is? Okay, so. Um, from my understanding, a fungible token is one that can very easily be exchanged with another one. So like an ERC-20 token, I can swap one Ether for another piece of Ether. It doesn't really matter which one I have. But when it's a non-fungible token, something very specific and unique, like a crypto kitty, um, those, um, you can't really trade them one for another without it not being the same one. Um, does, sorry, I'm not really good at explaining, but I mean, you're welcome okay. to. <laughs> um. So what um, you you're you're pretty close there. Um, so <laughs> so what what um, what's in the name basically is the concept of fungibility. So the great thing about money is that it's fungible. So I can take I can take maybe one euro and it's divisible into like its parts, which would then be a hundred cents. And so we can price goods and services at like varying degree based on the fungibility of money. Non fungible tokens or non fungible goods are by definition. De definition not fungible, so a, a house would technically be a non-fungible like asset or an artwork, um, and so this is what CryptoKitties I think really pioneered was the, the awareness of hey we can we can use non-fungible tokens which are not divisible by mm -hmm. by nature um, and apply them to all sorts of assets whereas most ERC twenty tokens are divisible up to twenty decimal places or most cryptocurrencies are divisible so. That's the whole, the whole definition of dividing a Bitcoin into like up to one Satoshi um, is essentially the concept of fungible. So I would add that um, a non-fungible token is often characterized by its unique metadata or by its unique characteristics. So the reason your house is non-fungible is because I can't just swap it for another house, <laughs> not even another one on your street. Whereas in the case of CryptoKitties, again, one is in, not really in any way meaningfully substitutable for another. But we do see a, a rise in fractionalization of non-fungible assets, which is to say you could take your house and actually fractionalize ownership in it, at which point you might have sort of fungible slices of a non-fungible asset. So things get interesting and complex fast when you start like combining these concepts. So when we talk about non-fungibility, I tend to emphasize the uniqueness characteristic and that mm. generally is defined in terms of you know, some metadata, if not like, you know, again, going back to the house, the data itself, the house is different from another one. So um, I, yeah, that's the, where I would put the emphasis for NFTs. Thank you, Ed. Um, other crypto economic parameters that we're not going to touch on today are pre prediction markets and stable coins. Um, but I'm not going to dive too deep into those. But I think those are there any others from crypto economic parameters that I'm missing? Besides the four that I've mentioned. I think the main thing is that the vast majority of them are likely undiscovered because in reality what we're describing are sort of unique mathematical patterns that result in some predictable, not predictable behavior so much as predictable properties associated with those things. And I, because of how new this is, I think the vast majority of them are yet to be determined. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to there was a question. Uh, Only speak up on the first All right. <laughs> I, I hate being in the spotlight. Anyway, um, what exactly is a crypto economic primitive? Who actually coined this term and what are its boundaries? So how do we know? Wow. Um, I'm going to, I don't know who coined it. It is in heavy enough use now that it shows up, I guess, without people realizing it. But I think I'm going to argue that a crypto economic primitive is essentially a design pattern in the same way that like, uh, you know, I, won't, I don't, I, like think of like a chip in a circuit board that has a certain set of patterns. Like it doesn't guarantee anything at the higher level, but it's sort of a, a combination of, in this case equations, but uh, a combination of, uh, of elements that it works the way that it works every time that you use it. And in a system like a, you know, crypto economic you know system we we for the vast vast majority of the time we don't actually know what we're going to get when we start combining them together but a bonding curve for example is one that I've worked with quite a bit and
Paul has worked with, and they're, they have um, logical rules that are assertable. Like, it's essentially a conservation law of sorts. And so when we use that primitive, we know that the conservation law is held. We don't actually know anything else, and when we start combining it with other things, we might get completely non-trivial sort of behavioral circuits with completely non-trivial properties, but we don't lose that sort of primitive conservation law. So anytime that you're building with something that has sort of assertable properties, I would say that that's acceptable to call a primitive. So a smart contract is not a cryptoeconomic primitive. I would not call it one, no. So it's like a more atom-like unit of a molecule, then this is a kind of molecule, right? Mm. Um, I would add one thing. So um, I think cryptoeconomic primitives, like proof of work, I think as a like as a design system, I would say is a cryptoeconomic uh -huh. primitive. Uh -huh. Proof of stake, in my opinion, would also be a primitive. Primitives are, I think, could be building blocks that enable completely new behavior. And as bonding curves started coming along, people were like, okay, this could be a new primitive. Although then I'd also argue, like ERC twenties, you could. That's more of a standard. It doesn't actually enable new behavior, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. I think we also have to recognize that we're in a very weak language space. So this field is so new that like there are terms being thrown out, coined, being like re like remapped and in fact I wouldn't put too much credibility on any particular definition in its current right. state. And this yeah. is actually one of the reasons why we need a sort of growing, I would say, a academic and research collaboration yeah. community yeah. because mm -hmm. the standardization of terms is actually something that often emerges through a, a kind of research, even an in, in inward facing research process. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think communication is a big one. <laughs> Um, but moving ahead, um, so curation markets, um, so this is basically saying the same thing, um, but market participants put their money where their mouth is, they stake value and attention into the markets which they believe will be more valuable, and the market's currency is a proxy for the attention. Uh, early adopters are very often rewarded uh, for their early attention to the market as the value increases, and this we can see through token bonding curves, I know quite strongly. Um, any comments on these four points? Or any questions on these four points? Um, I, so I think that um, in the case of curation markets, one of the ways I like to frame them is in terms of um, collaborative learning. So a well-engineered curation market is actually has the humans participating, providing signal, and the market itself is just a, an estimator of sorts. So there's some hidden private information on the part of the individuals, and there's an algorithm combined with some reward structures, which is job is to facilitate the estimation of that underlying hidden information. So in that way, it's actually much more closely related to AI and online learning than it is to, um, I mean, cryptography or even economics. Why? 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 Because actually designing estimators is something that is actually predicated on optimization theory and sort of the, oh, this is more than I want to try to go into here. But <laughs> in, in, in short, the idea is that you're designing a system where you are defining rewards. And the assumptions predicated are that the agents will use their private information to take an action that moves in a certain direction, say, increasing their potential returns. And as a result, then, if you only take as a prior assumption that they're going to leverage some private information to try to you know, profit along that vector, then what you're doing is trying to get them to reveal some preference or expose some information, and that the purpose of the curation market being to curate is then to essentially coordinate that large number of private signals into a global estimate, which is actually how sort of online and decentralized machine learning approaches are framed. So from a mathematics and from a design perspective, it's much more closely related to AI, even though what we're seeing is an emergent sort of behavioral economic phenomenon. So you would kind of go from design in the optimization and estimation paradigm to observing what people actually do and sort of measuring and studying and ideally feed that back on future designs. But it's engineering to behavioral economics back to engineering ad infinitum. Do I get you right that um, the way to make this a workable and a profitable in a sense system is to 
invent a way to analyze a crowd of, of these signals, right? A big de decentralized entity of very, like, well, very large entity, which the AI would do better than any kind of a human being or sort of. I think it's a way that I would more frame it is that it's sort of a cybernetic AI in the sense that mm -hmm. people are not actually exposing their private signals. They are, it's a sort of thing where they're acting in a certain way from which you might infer their private signals. But even still, you're not even necessarily inferring their private signals. You're actually only inferring an aggregate estimate of that is hidden in all of their private signals. It doesn't even mean that people have the answer. It means that through the highly divergent private signals of all of the participants that you hope to estimate some underlying true state of the world. And that framing is the like framing of online learning. And when I think about um, the curation markets, I generally think about them in terms of these online learning problems because ultimately that's the goal that curation markets are trying to accomplish. It's still not clear whether we've effectively done that with any of the curation markets that exist today, but in, in a sort of what is the objective of a curation market? Well, it's to estimate some hidden facts from a large number of actions of individuals who are taking those actions predicated on their private information. If I could maybe play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, how do you think uh, Reddit communities or Instagram or the stock market are different than yeah. the systems that we're building in terms of curation? Especially the stock market, which is exactly the same thing. I, I don't about. actually think that they're very different. I think all markets should be characterized as estimators, but not all estimators are actually good at estimating right. the thing that they're supposed to estimate. So take the stock market, for example. The financial incentives are not necessarily aligned with estimating the true state, so to speak. Yeah. They're actually aligned with incest. In they're, they are incentivizing you to estimate the future estimate of the other <laughs> players of the game. And that doesn't necessarily converge to an estimate of the state we're interested in. It actually converges to some shelling points which lead to some really weird dynamics that we actually observe. So ideally, we, if we were designing new kinds of markets, they would be designed from first principles to estimate the thing that we actually want to estimate rather than, you know, say, incentivizing people to estimate each other's future estimates. But DCR is exactly about estimating the other's future estimate. Yeah, so that was the reason why I said it's not immediately clear to me that we've done a good job of this yet in this community, just that we're moving in a direction where we have the equipment to potentially design better decentralized estimators. By the way, in the prediction markets like Gnosis are more into the vein you are talking about than the curation. A little bit, but most prediction markets, if they don't have a real observation of a relatively objective outcome, you still have essentially Keynesian beauty contest problems where people, so in a Keynesian beauty contest, it's a like economics, like canonical example where people actually are incentivized to vote for what they think is going to be the outcome, not what they actually think. And so this is a broad problem in any prediction market that is you know, predicated on something where there isn't a pretty objective measure of the outcome. Would it make you guys more comfortable if we had the stage lower down? Yeah. How do we how do we encourage more yeah. participation yeah, here? Yeah, I was worrying about you guys. Ah, yeah, sure. This way it's less scary. <laughs> so there's also this notion of um, semantic or linguistic arbitrage as well, which pops up on curation. Uh, Sorry, prediction markets. Um, so the question gets framed in as objective a way as possible, but sometimes people find ways to pose, deliberately pose ambiguous uh, questions, or frame, frame them ambiguously, and then take advantage of the asymmetry in the um, various planes of context which these we later interpreted. So yeah, it turtles all the way down. 
Well, it's sort of interesting, right? Because you see people finding ways to turn what are supposed to be complete contracts into incomplete contracts mm -hmm. by doing this sort of uh, linguistic technique. And I think that this sort of reopens a lot of the questions about like, you know, what is and is not objective and the extent to which putting something on a blockchain makes it objective. Because as long as there's a natural language component, there's always a subjective interpretation of that, you know, that claim or of that, you know, outcome. That now you're reminding me of the um, Arizona statute, which Angela Ross likes to, to quote and talk about, which I can't recite from memory, but uh, basically they're trying to give this definition of uh, a blockchain um, in the, you know, uh, regional legal legalese of, of the United States, various chambers of, of law in the United States. And this thing is, is so watered down to be completely meaningless. You know, it can be tokenized or tokenless and dis de decentralized or permissioned or, or for free and can be secured by proof of work or not. And there can be tokens or not. Um, and so then you start to get into that linguistic swamp where, you know, we, I still think we, we're there. I don't think we have workable definitions of any of these things. You might be able to convince someone that your database is a blockchain based on that definition. Sure, yeah, there's also <laughs> quite famous uh, social networking uh, uh, outfits that have got projects that they call blockchains that well, might not be blockchains if you... Does it still use way. cryptography? Oh, yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the definition. Actually, I'm a, I'm a fan of minimum, minimum viable definitions, using the absolute minimum definition and then qualifying and specifying it there. Because in a situation where the terminology isn't uh, mature or, or settled, um, people can be talking past each other. I mean, have you been to Twitter? Uh, that, is, <laughs> that is structurally set up for people that do not use the same um, framings and meanings of words, arguing past each other until they realize they agree. Um, I'm going to move ahead to the next one, but you're welcome to stay here because you, you participate. So um, so the next one is we're going to jump into token curated registries. Um, so these are TCRs, and basically what they are is a list. It's a fancy decentralized list um, that is curated by the token holders, token holders. Um, and this can be from anything, um, from names to hashes to records. Um, examples are like whitelists, uh, white lists, blacklists, um, lists of the best universities, lists of the best science projects. Um, and the holders of uh, the token holders stake their tokens to perform an action, either adding something to the list, challenging something on the list, removing something from the list. And there's a whole bunch of different types of lists. So you can have um, a normal real list, you can have a weighted list, you can have a list within a list. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do these registries. Um, and generally, the token holders will vote on whether or not to accept a new listing onto the list, uh, the registry. Um, how it works basically, so if, for example, um, everyone here in this room wanted to start a list and we were all token holders and we were going to vote on something science, yeah, we are going to vote on the best science projects of blockchain, science, blockchain for science 2019. Um, and we have all now got the baby list of the top 10 that we all like and we kind of voted on them and agreed on them. But then somebody comes in from, what science do you guys not like? All right. Then astrology tries to submit that their project was the best science project, and they um, they now stake maybe 50 of their tokens to try and get onto this best science project list. And everyone on our list, we kind of have a vested interest in making our list the best list um, because then it creates more value for itself, and it's also it can't be then infiltrated by other like let's say we want um, somebody wants to, like bribe us to get on the list or they want to have an unfair listing, um, and now we can also challenge this person who's trying to get on the list and say like nope. You are actually one of the best science projects and we're not going to let you on the list. He loses all of his stake tokens trying to get onto the list and he doesn't, we, we get the satisfaction of not having him on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or like answers to science questions or to hypothesis, right? So this could be on this list, right? Yep. This, okay. But yeah. I suppose, do you, want to, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on your question? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I mean, I mean yeah, we, we, we can like, so I have all these things, we are talking here about these things because they can be used in science and research for a lot of things, right? To find uh, solutions to hypothesis, to uh, the quality of data sets, and to create new incentive structures, right? Yeah. Zaka, yeah. Do you know about registered reports? Do you know about this idea of pre-committing to experimental designs and hypotheses prior to embarking on the experimental studies? This is quite a kind of uh, uh, well thought of idea in certain uh, experimental fields now, okay. as a way of like, um, 
so, so the ch big pivots and changes in experimental design are a bit more, people more transparent about things like that. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you could maybe use a, a TCR type system to kind of commit to various uh, uh, goals, experimental goals. Cool, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no why, why, why not? Why? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if it was missing from the discussion, but the idea of a skin in the game, mm -hmm. right? Um, if I understand the initial uh, uh, initial concept of the TCR as it was proposed by Mike Golden, right? In the white paper, yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. two years ago. Uh, yours, it's kind of more a, um, a coordination game than a prediction game. So you're not supposed to tell your opinion of this hypothesis. You are supposed to guess who will uh, who will, um, whether the majority of people, of token holders, of voters, would vote yes or no. Yep. That's the thing. So it's, it's more like the, uh, it's a weak spot is, or problematic spot that encourages like her behavior in a sense, guessing the, uh, what the majority thinks, but not mm -hmm. expressing your, I think it's also your own expertise. On the value of what the token or the list or the registry viewers will get out of it, for example, like um, the example I think that was used in that paper was a taco truck, like the list of the best taco trucks. Yes. Um, the list of the best taco trucks in New York was an example of one, being like people would not want to have a badly put together list because what is the point of having a list of the worst taco yeah, trucks? Yeah, yeah. And it's, not, it's, a, it's a strong point, the self-regulating system of this, yes, yeah, it's, it's quite okay, but my, my uh, argument was about the, in, exactly the incentive to vote. So in order to, because they have profit in here, they have tokens in here, and so you're, you're, you're getting profit if you vote to the majority. And no, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, I can even try to answer this. Uh, this is completely right if you, like, look at the system at one second, right? At one moment and freeze it there, and then you would create a list and the hypothesis. But as a scientist, you are, like, in the real world, right? And you're producing new results, new insights, right. maybe new data, right. and then you have, then it changes, and what the majority will, like, uh, vote as the right hypothesis or... Uh, together yeah, with like it. the creation market with yeah, the yeah, exactly, thing. Yeah. But TCR is a very binary thing, that's the problem. It's, it's you are either yeah. in or out. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I mean, you're describing what I brought up before in terms of the Keynesian beauty contest. So you reproduce that challenge. And I think that there has to be a, a separation based on the goals of the system. So a system that is outcome oriented might be very different from a system that is sort of vote outcome oriented. So I think the actual outcome of the research project and what determines whether it was successful, what that's the kind of thing that we would want to be rewarding based on. And there's some real open questions going back to the discussion of prediction markets about what is the like arbitrator of the outcome. But I do think that this use case that we're describing makes a lot more sense if any financial incentives that are woven into it or even you know, potential reputational incentives that are woven into it are actually associated with the outcome rather than with the outcome of the vote. And this means that we're dealing with who decides under what conditions and what are their vested interests. We're dealing with this sort of, you know, again, this Keynesian, Keynesian beauty contest problem in the sort of using the vote as an indicator of what the quote unquote outcome was. So to be clear, what I'm saying is if the outcome is a voted on thing, then all of the voters, if they're part of that same system, also have vested interests. So it's, it, it creates a very interesting, even temporally layered sort of economics question whenever you wire incentives in. The upside is that we're making this a lot more explicit. In the past, these sort of vested interests were a little bit more hidden. The downside is that now that they're explicit, we have to deal with them. What do you mean? This last thought I didn't get quite right. What do you mean by uh, vested interests in the coming? What do you mean by vested interests and their, their, them becoming explicit? So, so not just the, the vested interests, but in this case, so reputationally, for example, if you have a process where people are, say, voting for whether something was um, important or impactful, even, say, giving prizes in an academic okay, setting, okay. right? So people who are in the process of deciding that actually have non-trivial interactions with other people because you're part of the same sort of yeah. network. And so yes, yeah. 
what so I kind of feel. Behind the scenes arrangements, you mean like? Well, not even necessarily. So there's, there's behind the scenes arrangements that were like potentially attacks, but there's also just like natural biases. There's a reason <laughs> why, for example, sh you know, short, for a certain period after you finish your PhD, for example, your advisor is not going to be your reviewer, yeah. right? Like there's, there's a big web of interdependencies, people that you collaborate with or that you sort of have cite frequently might actually behave differently towards you from people people who you don't cite frequently, or that when you do, you actually say, well, hey, like, this person did this, but I don't agree with that. Uh -huh. And then you have explicit voting, and you, you can say, hey, if, you, if I cite you, you can support me, that's okay. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, so what I'm getting at is that, that there's a lot of sort of behind the scenes sort of incentives that have existed forever, mm -hmm. and that while we're dealing with some pretty complex incentive problems, the upside is that they're, they are explicit rather than implicit, which makes mm -hmm. them a little easier to face head on, even if they're not immediately clear that we have solutions, we make assumptions, we make decisions, and we say, hey, this thing is good in this way and weak in that way, and we can kind of watch our blind spots. But when, the, when we don't really understand the assumptions we're making, or the sort of economic incentives are hidden, then sometimes it's easier to miss that we have blind yeah, spots yeah. at all. But, uh, so if I get you right, you imply a multi-stage system in which the voting, or TCR enabled voting, is just one of the stages, right? It's not the ultimate sovereign uh, who, uh, what, um, makes the final decision, right? Yeah, I'm, so I'm not intending to imply a specific design, but to go back to Wasim's sort of comment about um, you know, the specific process, I am saying that it would make sense to have a temporally broken apart process where the first stage, which was sort of signaling the support of certain methods, experimental methods, objectives, etc., uh -huh. was separated from then the outcome, and then the the notion of the outcome would be a different process from the voting about whether or not it should be supported. Because there's new information, right? You have the actual outcomes, was it executed well, maybe it didn't have positive results, but it provided new information to the scientific community. And then build service, social survey in a sense, like po po a poll. I'm, I am saying that it could be a poll, I'm saying it could be a third party adjudicator, I'm saying at the very least, you want a separation from the initial signaling that says, hey, we should do this, to, hey, how did that work out? And even if we do that, we still have a risk of embedded sort of vested interests. Okay, all right. Sorry, that was a lot. I hope it was not too much. No, I think it's uh, really interesting to be able to dive into a lot of these topics. Do you want to? I would like to criticize one, one point on this list. Uh, oh, majority, you, yeah. majority wins the vote. So, um, I mean, TCRs are nice. Um, yes. They are probably useful for, for, some, for some scenarios, some applications. Um, but if the, if the goal is to actually get a good overview on what the social choice of everyone is and to get a consensus about what is the ordering in the list, there are probably much better developed voting schemes mm. existing, um, which we know about from research uh, from past decades, which could not be applied in the real world in political elections because basically the, the cost is too high to perform them. But thinking about the more advanced uh, voting schemes, I'm thinking about things like Schulze method, for example, which establishes a, a graph-based voting uh, tallying method, which will give you a very nice ordering of choices, not only based on majority, not only based on simple voting schemes like instant runoff voting, which we have in the US primaries, subject to spoiler effect, uh, people can win or items on the list can be considered popular, in fact they aren't, they are spoilers. And I think we should really think more about to integrate all this research from social choice theory and voting theory that has been done over the past decades and integrate them into these nice technologies because we can actually do it now but I'm not seeing it showing up so much yet. I concur, and I would say that this sort of is the, um, uh, it's the sort of other side of my points earlier about estimation theory, so I view the sort of social choice theory as being what is essentially the social science history of the problem of basically inferring a collective choice from a 
from not just people's inputs, but also a processing of them. And then we have sort of on the more technical history, this sort of you know estimation theory, and that by revisiting them, and ideally together, um, we'll be able to view these as actual, you know, inputs being private information from individuals that is you know theirs to give and sort of algorithms or processes or voting schemes as means of aggregating that information into a social choice and that now that we can essentially program those things in a in a way that we can sort of trust that the methods will be executed genuinely we get to basically build on the whole history of the sort of voting systems and social choice literature, and we may even get to sort of level it up with the sort of theory of um, decentralized estimation and signal processing. I agree, and maybe to add one more point, so if you ever work on a TCR and think about social choice theory, keep in mind Arrow's theorem, and be aware that it has been proven there is no perfect voting system. You can't build a perfect voting system. So whatever you design, whatever you develop, whatever you TCR you, you build, you have to, cho to choose uh, f for a flaw, basically. So you will be sure that there is at least one flaw in your, in your voting system, but you have to choose the right one according to what you wish for. Right. And so funny thing is that I, I, this is actually one of the original motivations for why my slides earlier had this discussion about subjective choices of objective measures is because whenever we're entering into designing these systems, we're making subjective choices, whether it's which flaw you're gonna take or in, in a more broad sense, I tend to frame it in terms of um, some sort of optimization objective, which is to say you have to pick, if you pick an objective and your system is derived from an optimal estimate of something, then there's a bunch of things that you chose not to optimize for. And so inevitably, the algorithm design is going to be a subjective choice even if it's framed as a solving for an objective function. And that can be confusing when the term is literally objective function, when there's no way to pick one that isn't a subjective choice. You got good hearted. Yeah. yeah, so good heart's law is uh, one way of framing the idea that uh, anything which becomes uh, optimization target uh, will be se itself be manipulated for. Um, so any kind of naive metric that you choose will be optimized by people that are looking to yeah. game or arbitrage that yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. So you know that's the, that's the folly of going too far over to the objective side. If you rely on, on like bare metal objectivity, then you may find yourself in the good heart domain. Uh, but if you're in the subjective domain, then it's just your opinion, man. Yeah, if, if you measure a system, you change the system, right? That's the same thing. But yeah, it, it, I mean, it, go, that's, it gets even worse when we yeah. talk about like observer yeah. effects and, and stuff. And exactly, exactly. And this is what I like about the whole blockchain and crypto economy for science scene, because we can very quickly uh, introduce new systems so it becomes very hard for researchers to manipulate them. At the moment, we have one monolithic system, almost one. It's like as you would have an open Google algorithm, page rank algorithm, and all the web pages could adapt for it, right? But Google is constantly changing it, so the web pages can't adapt to it. And with blockchain, we can build very easily and quickly changing still objective, somewhat objective in terms of what you measure. Sorry, I don't want to get into your definition. Somewhat objective Same. functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, I use it in front of you. So, but but it, at least like provable to the outside or blockchain secure or at least to build it very easily. So it, it, becomes, it becomes hard for researchers to game it because they have to change every year. And so they might end up doing what's best for science instead of for the system, right? Or I, 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 I have a blog post for all this. Like I wrote it. Or and let me just yeah, tell yeah, you okay. let me just, there's this one example which is quite relevant, which is the uh, example of Monero, which is a putatively yeah. ASIC resistant GPU mined cryptocurrency, and they currently hard fork on schedule twice a year, and every year, six months now they have to change their mining algorithm um, okay. because at first it was ASICs. And then now it looks like it's just really uh, quickly tuned uh, FPGAs. So the substrate is okay. modifiable. So the, they're playing the game to, to change the rules, but the, the rule breakers also have flexibility now. So this is kind of like an arms race. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Be careful. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. I'm gonna move ahead to token bonding curves in the interest of pizza. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, our next topic or our next crypto economic primitive is token bonding curves. And what I've got here are, is that token bonding curves serve as an automatic market maker to a token. 
Uh, the bonding curves issue its own tokens through buy and sell functions, and uh, where the price and supply is set by the market demand, price per token increases as the number of tokens supplied increases. So I've got, um, I've got this chart, actually it's from the Molecule Catalyst um, learning page. Um, I was going to ask Paul to, to dive into it a little bit more, so I'm going to hand over to anyone in the crowd or anyone on our panel that would like to dive into token bonding curves. I'm going to proffer a definition, at least, or a characterization. So um, in my experience, the best way to characterize a bonding curve is as a conservation law relating the supply to a, um, a, a basically bonded amount of currency. So it doesn't matter what the other currency is. You have a sort of reserved currency that you bond in order to mint a token. When you burn that token, you're able to withdraw from the bonded pool. And that what you're actually doing is imposing an equation that says that the um, amount bonded is equal to an amount of supply, and that every transaction, regardless of whether you're bonding or burning, is going to preserve that relation. And while this is um, not immediately obvious, the implied spot price of this is actually the tangent to the curve in the state space representation which sounds really mathy and obnoxious, but actually it makes for a much more coherent representation from a, a systems um, perspective. And then you're essentially designing that conservation law, the price dynamics, the supply and demand dynamics, and all of the rest come as a consequence of that one assertion. And then when people act on it, they're essentially moving along the curve and ideally finding a point that sort of balances out supply and demand. So it functionally becomes a, a, an automated market maker, but the shape of that market is actually encoded in one relation between the supply of the token and the quantity of the reserve currency that's currently bonded. I'm picking up so much um, communication differences between the words that you use and the words that our team uses. So we use words like incentive pools um, for our reserve. Um, and I mean, it's, it's just an issue that comes, I think, with a lot of the, these new um, new terms. Um, is that we're, could, we could all be talking about the same thing in completely different words. Um, but yes. Well, if it helps, <laughs> I'm like working on trying to write some actual like you know peer review papers related to some of the like concepts. So I'm hoping that eventually those ki those things will find their way into. Um, sort of a, a canonical like set of definitions, but as we discussed yeah, earlier, we're like completely useful. like completely lacking them. So the, the current the language I'm using is largely derived from efforts to write formal proofs about the properties of the curves that we're using, mm -hmm. as opposed to I think something that's maybe a little bit more directed at describing to a user what their incentives are like. So, you know, the, the task of communicating formal properties and the task of communicating, here's what you're gonna get if you participate in this thing, are actually different enough that they almost certainly actually necessitate some different language patterns. Yeah, very much so. I'm pretty sure when I asked if originally somebody else was working on token bonding curves, I saw a hand or two. Is there anyone else in the audience that's working on a project that uses them? Well, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just like uh, like what's your question? Like asking questions. I I will tell you. What's sure. My so opinion. what is your name and what are you working? Uh, my name is Alex. I uh, I'm working in DAP dot world. Mm -hmm. So um, and uh, I think uh, bonding curves. It's uh, like there is like basically nothing to add to gentlemen's already said. But uh, it's just a good mechanism for illiquid assets, but which becomes inefficient when dynamic of the market changes a lot and it's basically just an arbitrage opportunity after that that's it do you feel like they are oh, like you said illiquid uh, assets but it's it's very much a way to make them liquid um so yeah, for yeah. example we're using what we want to or envision with molecule is using it for ip and creating liquid models for ip and that's something yeah. that i think has never been able to be done before yeah so but uh, some ip are liquid some are not yeah, so and if you Tokenize an IP, like as you said, like fractionalize in the, uh, this uh, asset. Uh, some of them might be very, very liquid and very high in high demand. Some of them might be not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as I said, like I, I've been discussing with Paul already, that um, 
it, uh, sometimes it's useful to have a bounding curve and uh, to like provide liquidity for people who want to sell, but it's not always uh, how say ideal mechanism mm -hmm. for doing this. And also, I wanted to add like did, uh, to uh, oh, okay, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so basically, uh, the uh, how say. Um, the difference between micro market dynamic from the beginning when you introduce bounding curve and when market involves could become such big that most of the like shape of the market will be so different from the boundary curve that um, like you, you will not be able to efficiently use uh, boundary curve to either sell or buy so it just will be not enough to arbitrage. Um, prior to moving on, which I think we should probably keep trying to do, I will note that bonding curves are interesting in that they actually only define the sort of rules of the system. So there's actually a really important open question on any particular system about how to initialize them, because even if you have that curve, it's a, it's a bunch of points on a line. So where you are when you initialize it has a big effect on sort of even what, what happens with people w w interacting with it to sort of um, even the trajectories that it can follow. So there's a very serious initialization question that has to be answered for any project, even if they have decided on a bonding curve or even designed a particular bonding curve. Um, you, when you actually initialize it, it has to be somewhere on the curve. Yeah. I think also a very interesting discussion you guys started is about um, a value, like token created markets, token created registries, and that you estimate future estimate or future estimate and it's like infinitely. And uh, I, I think like um, like what's the problem with token credit registries if you create it with the assets like uh, like money, it's on always gonna be like false incentive. Almost always like all because like uh, even what is the value? What is the like value? It's always an estimate of our society, and always depends on the context, on the dynamic. Because money is completely artificial thing, so you just estimate like some like uh, I don't know vector of values, <laughs> something like this, and in, in the dimension of where, where estimate happens, always changes. I think that's um, that's actually a good segue for us into our next section now, which is um, well, I was going to run to that. Oh. Yes, of course. Uh, I have always been criticizing the current economic system because it disregards the uh, some of the laws of nature and uh, uh, accepts that uh, nature supplies are unlimited and that our consumerism and growth and expansion are the only ideals. So uh, in this kind of uh, context, uh, token value, how can we make sure that we don't do the same greedy and fear-based approaches uh, as we did with the current economics and then do something, come up with something more um, sustainable? Um, so the short answer for me is that that lives at the level of the system that you are representing. So a lot of what we're talking about here is methods, tools, both things that are being tried and being created to represent parts of systems. But in fact, this is still more on the bottom up side of the discussion. I think all of these tools are put into practice in an effort to both represent and steer these sort of social, economic, physical systems, and that the challenge actually lives at the side of making sure that you are representing something well. And if you are not adequately internalizing externalities, if you're not recognizing where your system has boundaries with the outside world and sort of like what blind spots you get from that, or basically the touch points between your system and what it encapsulates and what you know that it doesn't, you're always gonna end up with these kinds of arbitrages of externalities. So it's a little bit less about these tools and more about the taking a systems-oriented view of defining what you're even doing with these tools. You mean? Well, may I 
Yeah, so I, I think like this is the thing I'm like constantly thinking about, like how because like we're now at the stage which 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 potentially we can redesign uh, the system like of the society to uh, towards like um, like, like how, how I'll say like uh, to make it basically better. Uh, and I, I think uh, the reason why like our like society uh, our current civilization like is not like the best in like two uh, sometimes like you call it radical capitalism and something like this like too much about money driven and so on because money is the only universal measurement tool it's like the only which which uh, we works for everything you can almost anything measure with money because like it's a uh, Actually, you cannot anything measure money, but all, all of us is measured with money right now. And so today, it, unlimited money means unlimited power. Yeah, it's something like this. So, and but it's like it's not the most efficient measurement mechanism because like money is artificial, uh, and uh, I believe that incentive system works that if you measure something, people will chase it. So if something is not measured, it's hard to chase it. So it's hard to chase like. Uh, uh, quality of your publication if only quantity of references is considered so an impact factor it's also basically quantitative uh, more than qual qual quality uh, metric so so I believe that the way to go is to measure things which we value which 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 is closer like not to, not to have universal like measurement mechanism but have a measurement for healthcare for education for scientific contribution and so on, and once we introduce it, and once it's accurate enough, once it's good enough, like it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough to uh, how to steer our society to uh, and align it uh, to achieve that goal. Do we have an example of that comes maybe a little, even a little closer rather than others? Sure, it's the index of uh, country development, something like this. So this once it started to be measured. M many countries started to chase it and like and not to be like only uh, I would say uh, profit driven but also to consider how well is education how well is healthcare within your country and so on and you have again you can have this good hearts law which was mentioned already like and the whole matrix craze which is considered to be even more dangerous if you talk about the good of society then the matrix craze the craze for uh, quantitative indicators is even a more I don't know, error-prone thing. Uh, if, guys, I think we're actually talking about science. And it's, uh, yeah, we should, uh, and I think uh, if we talk about all these nice little mechanisms and science, there are two important points to be made, uh, or two poles, I would say, to opposite, uh, I don't know, attraction, attract poles of attraction. One is uh, basically these things are, in, uh, TCR and the creation markets are very, formidable, very uh, rigorous uh, stock exchange kind of, uh, or capitalism, uh, economic style uh, tools, which are about maximizing profit and getting, well, well, getting profit, right? And another poll is basically what you were very insightfully talking about. It's uh, the uh, end goal is not the profit, but the um, getting the information, not information, the accurate prediction to get the, what the people think the in, 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 internal uh, uh, oracle to get it outside, right? And to invent some ways to measure, to gorge it, whatever, right? Uh, and so but probably the, the second, uh, the second uh, way of, uh, the second avenue that this mechanism open is more, uh, is more interesting for science, in my opinion. Because if we put the things together, like one is a, uh, an engine for, getting profit. Uh, the other one is the engine of getting the internalities, right? The internal things outside. Private signals. Private signals, yes. Uh, and probably at the intersection of those, we have a very nice thing that I would like to talk about. The, what is value? Actually, what is the value here that we are talking about? I mean, in business, value is uh, your, how you call it, balance sheet, right? Like, you are either you're in the black or in the red. But here, in science, what is value? I mean, uh, it's, it's a, a very sorry that Paul left us because uh, his molecular is very much like, um, uh, it's, at least it's been a, building a workable definition of value. A value is a potential commercialization, right? Commer uh, of a certain scientific idea of a project, whatever, of a substance, whatever. So, no? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. But uh, it's okay, it's a workable definition, but not all scientific projects are made with the final goal of selling shares from a company that yeah. will manufacture a new drug, all right? In nuclear physics, zoology, history, you name it, psychology, I mean, value is something different. And probably if you could talk about what kind of a value could we insert in the system? Right. Uh, so I will comment that I think one of the challenges that we run into is that there is no, and I don't think there can be one sort of even high dimensional representation of all forms of value, that in a sense that it is in itself something that kind of, I mean, in some ways we could say it emerges from its own pursuit. That like the effort to achieve something is what is our best way of measuring whether that thing is valuable and that doesn't limit itself to just money. Um, I would argue that this recognition that, that all models are inherently, you know, incomplete, wrong, or, um, you know, the famous Georgie Box quote is all models are wrong, but some are useful, kind of brings us round to, uh, you know, do we have the model that is useful to the ends that we're trying to achieve? And then that becomes a sort of meta iteration. All we can do is sort of decide on some objectives, you know, and then build a system to steer in pursuit of those objectives. And if they no longer line up with our sort of, you know, what we feel like is progress, then we also have to have the ability to retune the metrics so that we're simultaneously benefiting in the short term from everyone sort of gaming the metric because that's what we want until the metric is no longer a good representation of the direction we want to run in. Then we need the ability to essentially steer. Like we need a, sort of navigation system, not just a, you know, propulsion system. Okay. But then that's just us, right? At some level, that's people steering. Like, we can't ultimately, we, we can't give a computer system the ultimate level of that stack, right? So no matter how much we automate, we're, like, trying to add layers, but leaving some sort of human decision-making and governance for what direction we want to be moving in. Yes, the government, yes, it's, a, it's a one very important term that you mentioned. So it basically comes down to uh, setting the boundaries of a certain community of scholars, of stakeholders of any kind, that set their, their rules, their goals, their values, and then, and exactly then from this collective, in a sense, decision, they would stem the uh, the more precise computer-assisted metrics were there, right? So I think in order to help wrap this up, yes. I'm going to make a comment about CAD CAD since... So my, my team at Block Science developed this tool, computer-aided design. Um, it's actually complex adaptive dynamics computer-aided design. It's really a tool for computational social science mixed with engineering design. We have data scientists and control engineers and economists on our team, and what we realized was we wanted to be able to do simulations of the potential consequences of our design choices with a sort of a more open, open-facing view. So, you know, make some assumptions, then run some experiments, say, okay, well, if I assume that, then this will happen, and then change the assumptions, and run another experiment, maybe change the designs, but ultimately, we would be version controlling not just the designs, but also the assumptions, which is tricky, because most of scientific work works that way, but a lot of the sort of economics principles actually take the assumptions as given, and they don't cross-check them. Whenever we don't know something, you know, we should be saying, what if A, what if B, what if C? And a good design is one that holds up even if it's A, B, or C in real life, or, you know, maybe E happens, but hopefully E is somewhere in the convex hole of A, B, and C, so the likelihood of the system breaking is small. It's this sort of tool for combining engineering design with data science. Um, if anybody is interested in it, um, we've got uh, tutorials and we've got some early examples and some teams um, using it for design, including Molecule, and I'm um, excited for other people to be um, interested in integrating basically computational social science experiments into design workflows for token engineering or even just for business model innovation.
Um, I can take a question or two, but it's. I think we pretty much yeah, want to be done. We're basically, I think, at time, more or less. But we've also just recently done a really good AMA, so ask me anything with the CAD CAD team. So if you do have any questions around that as well, so it's really good reporting. I think it's available on your side as well. Uh, yes. Um, Cool. Yeah, so basically, thank you everyone for participating. I think yeah. the last thing that I just want to leave you guys with is crypto economics and science. So how to use all of these tools in science now and how, how um, what projects are using them, what are the possible things that we could use, how would it change the way that we that science works and the different incentive models that we can use um, moving forward. Um, but I'm sure that that's maybe a topic you can take with you into your beer and pizza. Wow, cool. So. Um, yeah, thank you everyone so much for, for joining the workshop and thank you so much to all of you guys for participating. Um, everyone in the crowd uh, was really interesting and um, yeah, that's, that's a wrap. Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.